Welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Um, welcome to the Wagner Free Institute of Sciences Weeknights at the Wagner Digital Talk Series. I'm Susan Glassman, Director of the Wagner Free Institute of Science, and we're really thrilled to have you join us for tonight's talk, You Complete Me, A Symbiotic View of Life, with Dr. Scott Gilbert. Um, some of you may have seen Scott speak for us before. He's both a biologist and a historian of biology, and he brings those twin perspectives to his work and his research. Scott has spoken for the Wagner many times before when he was a professor and chair of biology at Swarthmore College. He is now an emeritus professor and living in Portland, Oregon. And COVID has granted us, along with all the challenges, this actual wonderful opportunity to have Scott back at the Wagner, so to speak, talking with us from the comfort of his home while we and you are in the comfort of yours. So we're really glad to have him able to wire in like this. Just a few words about the Wagner before we start and some previews of some of the other programs we have coming up. The Wagner Free Institute of Science is a natural history museum and educational institution located in Philadelphia. Founded in 1855, we have a dual mission. We teach contemporary science to the public, as we're doing tonight, and we also interpret and preserve the Wagner's historic building, which is a time capsule of 19th century science. Tonight's talk is just one of many programs that we offer, and as it says in our name, the Wagner Free Institute of Science, our programs are all free, and our goal is to make them truly accessible to everyone. Our National Landmark Building houses a museum, a library, and a historic lecture hall, which is where many of our programs normally take place. While we've been closed for COVID, we've adapted our programs to offer them remotely, and this fall we're making all courses, lectures, science lessons, and museum tours available to everyone from home. Tonight's talk is part of our We Nights at the Wagner series. We're offering it bi-weekly on Wednesday nights, each with a different speaker. And the next one is October 14th with Dr. David Robinson. He's the National Malacologist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and he's going to talk about a dangerous invasive species, the giant African snail, something to watch out for. This Saturday, uh, we'll be hosting our first virtual open house from 2 to 4 p.m. as part of the Delaware River Festival. Um, Wagner's educators and scientists, including me, will be live streaming from the Wagner and all over parts of the city to teach about river streams and water quality now and in history. Next week, um, we'll be starting our multi-week science courses on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Uh, Darren Hayton is teaching about plagues and epidemics in history, and Michael Lewis is teaching about public health in the city, so there, it's all very topical this fall. Both courses will meet for six weeks online. And then lastly, we're really excited to present for the first time our annual Lantern Slide Salon online. That's on October 22nd. Many of these programs are posted on our website and we'll be adding more over the next week or two. So if you're interested in staying connected, check out the website or sign up for any newsletter or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We hope you'll join us for what promises to be a really interesting but online learning experience. So as I said tonight, we're thrilled to have Dr. Scott Gilbert. He is the Howard A. Schneiderman Professor of Biology Emeritus at Swarthmore College, as well as a Finland Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Uh, Scott trained as a developmental biologist and a historian of science. He has taught embryology, developmental genetics, and history of biology for 35 years. His research has focused on how evolutionary novelty comes into existence through changes in gene expression and changes in symbiont acquisition. He's considered an expert on two critical questions in evolution and embryology. How the turtle gets its shell, which he's actually talked for us about, and how the cow gets its specialized stomach. Having majored in both biology and religion, 
Scott has spoken at several Vatican conferences, and in 2016, he was honored to present a developmental biology lecture to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He has three textbooks that are now in print, uh, Developmental Biology, Ecological Development Biology, and my personal favorite, Fear, Wonder, and Science in the New Age of Reproductive Biotechnology. Scott is a member of the Wagner's Advisory Board. He's been incredibly supportive of our work and our mission, and is among the most popular of all our speakers. He is really gifted at making the most complex scientific ideas accessible and understandable. I particularly love to introduce Scott because he has one of the most eclectic set of credentials and interests of anyone I've ever known. And I just want to say that on top of all the accomplishments I just listed, outside the classroom and the laboratory, he plays piano and was a member, I don't know if he still is, of the band Kanish, one of Swarthmore's premier klezmer bands. So I hope to know that they're still in existence. First of all, thank you, Susan, so much. Uh, I love being at the Wagner. It's one of my favorite places in Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, when we moved to uh, Portland, there are some things we miss about Philadelphia and the Wagner is certainly, certainly one of them. Uh, I just second your motion that people should get involved. It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful group of people. And it's an incredible mission. Uh, I kind of have to imagine myself in the Wagner Amphitheater with the busts of Darwin and Lighty looking down very sternly at me. Uh, yes, I, can he pull this off? Uh, I want to talk about our identity. I want to talk about the notion we have of our individuality. Because usually when we think of an organism, we think of an individual or a group of individuals. And let's see if I can get this uh, moving. Let's see. Uh, no. Okay. Okay, how do Is I... Is it not advancing? It's not advancing. Sometimes um, in your bottom left, there should be little back oh, yeah. and forward so arrows. There we go. Sometimes. Okay, very good. So when we talk about biological individuality, we usually have six or seven ideas. First is the anatomical individuality, the, the countable people, for instance, uh, on a street. That's, you know, how many individuals are there? You can count them. That's anatomy. Then there's the notion of the physiological individual, which is that all your organ parts are working towards a common end, are working towards the persistence of your life, your blood system is integrated to your endocrine system. The endocrine system is integrated into your nervous system and so forth. Then there's the notion of developmental individuality, that each individual is the product of a fertilized egg. We, our body, is the descendant of the fertilized egg, that there's nothing in our body that does not come from the fertilized egg. Then there's the notion of immune individuality. If I were to put your skin, my skin onto you, you would reject it because it is not you. That there's this notion that the body keeps away things that are foreign from it. It rejects others. And that's the immune system, the immune individuality. Then there's the notion of genetic individuality. That I am who my genome says I am. This is a very common notion in America. 23andMe, um, uh, Ancestry.com says, send me your DNA. We will tell you who you are. Well, they can't tell us who we are, but the notion of that we are what our genes are is, a, is another way of looking at individuality. Then there's the notion of evolutionary individuality, that the individual is that which gets selected for by natural selection during evolution. Could be a gene, could be an organism. So there are these notions, these six major notions of biological individuality. And what I hope to tell you today is something terrifying, identity challenging, and awesome. Namely, that all those six ideas of individuality are wrong. That you are wonderfully and fearfully made 
but you may not be who you think you actually are. Because I'm going to try to show you that you are not merely an individual. You are a biome. You are a collection of functionally dependent ecosystems. You contain hundreds of species. Now, you have half the cells of your body as microbes. Half the cells in your body are bacteria. That's kind of an amazing thing. And the notion that the name for you, including your bacteria, so the zygote derived cells, the cells from the fertilized egg, plus the cells that you get from the environment, the microbes, they constitute something called a holobiont, the whole living thing. So plants and animals, I will tell you, fungi too, are not merely the products of the fertilized egg, they are holobionts. And I'll give you some examples of the animal plus its persistent microbial communities. Think of a cow. And when you think of a cow, you probably think of some female bovine organism eating grass and somehow turning that grass into milk, okay? Now, the amazing thing is the cow can't eat grass. Cow can't eat grain. There's nothing in the genome of the cow. There's no gene in the cow that encodes enzymes that permits it to digest cellulose or pectins. The major plant substances, cellulose, the highest concentration of organic carbon in the planet, can't be digested by cows. What digests them are the microbes in the cow's gut. The cow is a ruminant. It has a rumen. It has a special portion of the stomach which houses bacteria. And these bacteria digest the grass, not the cow. Coral, you see a blue coral and a white coral. The blue coral has algae in it. These are living coral. The living coral not only contains the animal, coral animal, but it also contains algae, a type of algae which is living inside the coral cells. And inside the coral cells, these algae undergo photosynthesis. They convert CO2 with, and water with light into carbohydrates. They make food for the coral. Over 90% of the food in the coral is made by the algae. And so when the algae perish, when the algae die, or when the algae leave, the coral dies. So the coral can't make food for itself. It needs the photosynthetic algae. And on the lower part of the slide is a termite, Mastotermes darwinensis. It is an agricultural pest. It eats trees. It eats wood. It eats homes. But it can't. It can't digest wood. There's nothing in the termite genes that allow the termite to digest wood. Those genes, the genes which make the enzymes that digest wood, are found in this microbe, uh, uh, which digests, this particular microbe, Mixotricha paradoxica, digests the, uh, the wood. This actually is not just one organism. This is a composite of five organisms which live together. So what is an individual? Well, the holobiont says it's the animal plus its persistent microbial communities. So we dealt a little bit with the notion of anatomical individuality, that the individual is an organized collective of cells derived from the fertilized egg. And what I'm telling you is 50% of the cells of our body are microbes. They have specific locations. Each area of your body has different ecosystems. Each one of us has about 160 species living on us. There's about 1,100 species of microbes in the human organism. And you can envision each pore as a separate ecosystem, truly truly amazing. And so this is who we are. Now, how do we get these microbes? We get them actually as a gift from our mother. 
and uh, see if I can, let's see, did I miss one here? Here we are. Bacteria are a gift from your mother. During the last trimester of pregnancies, of pregnancy, the last three months of pregnancy, the microbes of the woman's gut and the microbes of her reproductive tract actually change. So that these aren't the usual microbes that are there. These are special microbes. These microbes actually help the pregnancy. And these are the microbes that you want to be transmitted to the baby. And so in the female reproductive tract, in the female gut, new microbes are taking over. The hormones are selecting for a different set of microbes. And when you are born, the amnion breaks. And when the amnion breaks, you pass through the reproductive tract of your mother. And as you pass through your mother's reproductive tract, all those bacteria in the mother's reproductive tract come into your body. They colonize your body. Now, once they are there, they have to be fed. And mother's milk contains two sets of nutrients. One set of nutrients, it's obvious, it's for the baby. You feed the baby. But there's another set of nutrients, a set of special sugars that no mammal can digest. These sugars are not for the mammal. These sugars are not for the baby. These sugars are for a certain set of microbes that you want to thrive in your own gut. These are foods that are given to bifidobacteria, a certain type of bacteria that you want to be the first colonizer of your gut because they will allow the other microbes to come in and colonize. Because the microbes that come in to colonize your gut are not merely there to help you digest food, and they're not there because it's convenient for them to get the food that we offer them. They are there to help your body. Physiologically, I'm going to say that we are holobionts. We animals do not function as independent entities. In a particular bug, a mealy bug, Planococcus, uh, the pathway to make the amino acid phenylalanine starts off in the symbionts, in the bacteria found in the cells of the bug. And then the pathway goes into the bacteria's bacteria. The bacteria has a symbiont living in it, smaller bacteria. And then the pathway goes back into the bacteria. And finally, the last steps are made by the bug to make the amino acid phenylalanine. So to make phenylalanine, an amino acid, it uses the insect, the insect symbiont, and the insect symbionts symbionts. In mammals, the microbes are important for our digestive system, for the neuroendocrine system. They are responsible for helping bones to grow. They actually help make the immune system, and they keep the heart flowing on the right circles. So the microbes are involved in all these aspects of our body and animals don't function as independent entities. Let me give you a fascinating example. You learned in high school about peristalsis, the fact that if you eat something, it gets pushed through your digestive tract by wave-like motions. The muscles contract and make peristaltic waves such that you can even eat upside down. Okay, the muscles just to keep that rhythm going. Well, what keeps the muscle's rhythm going? Well, those are the nerves that are in the digestive tract. And what keeps the nerves going? The microbes. The gut microbes in your gut will make products. They will secrete short-chain fatty acids, as microbes do. Those short-chain fatty acids, things like propionic acid, butyric acid, they will enter the gut epithelium and they will tell the gut epithelium, make the hormone serotonin. And when they make the hormone serotonin, this will convert immature neurons into mature neurons. Without the serotonin, the, mature, the neurons do not mature and you cannot push food through your gut. Now, we're at the Wagner. If you went to the Mutter Museum, you would see the megacolon of someone who could not push 
food through their gut. 40 pounds of feces were taken from this person when they died. Okay, gut microbes are needed to mature the neurons, which allows you to pass food through your gut. So this is important. So you are not functioning, functioning alone. You're functioning with the help of microbes. We're learning new things each year. This was a paper from 2018. We learned, for instance, that obesity may be regulated in part by bacteria. These people, Star Ridauer and his colleagues, took obese twins and lean twins, twins that were identical twins, but who differed because one was fat and one was thin. And they took the microbes from their gut and they put them into mice whose own microbes have been banished. They've got, they're, they're germ-free mice. They're mice without any bacteria in their guts. And they put in bacteria from the obese twin. That mouse became obese. They put in bacteria from the lean twin. That mouse remained thin. So it looks like the bacteria are in part regulating obesity. There's a particular type of bacteria, Tristan Senella, which may reduce obesity. They're prevalent in people who are lean and they reduce weight gain when placed in obese mice. So we are physiologically as well as anatomically holobionts, communities of organisms. Well, what about genetic individuality? And I said, I said this is the genetic, this is the kind of common individuality that we're told that DNA is your essence, that DNA is your soul, uh, that from which you could be resurrected after death. Uh, this is all hype. It's, uh, I think, the worst type of scientific baloney. Uh, but you see this all over the place. Here's the ad for the mid-sized Hummer. Same DNA, smaller chromosomes. It means that the essence of this small Hummer is a real Hummer. Same DNA, but it's just a smaller model, smaller chromosomes. Uh, you have to be very careful because you will hear all the time that DNA is your essence, that uh, you know, the sauna is in the DNA of every fin. No, they've sequenced a lot of Finnish DNA. The sauna is not there. The sauna is in the soul of every fin, not in DNA. But it's very important to realize that bacteria can also give you your characteristic features. That bacteria are important. This is just data showing that in the P aphids, it's the bacteria that allow the organism to function at high temperatures. Thermotolerance of the P aphid is not given by a gene in the P aphid. It's given by a gene in the bacteria that's in the cells of the P. aphid. This could be very important in humans. For instance, people have been looking for the genes that might predispose us to asthma. Well, asthma might be a product of not our genes, but bacterial genes. And it's been shown that most city people lack bacteria that people who are live near farms have in abundance. So there are certain bacteria like ruminococcus, which everyone who lives near a farm has, but hardly anybody who lives in the city has. And what they found was if you go to people's homes and if the people have homes that have the farm-like bacteria in them, they have a much less chance of having asthma. So we might have evolved to expect the genes from certain bacteria to be active in us. And if we don't have that bacteria, we are susceptible to things like asthma. So we are not anatomically individuals. We're holobionts. We're not physiologically individuals. We're holobionts. And we're not genetically individuals. We're holobionts. Now, I want to spend some time on development, this notion of development, because we were taught in high school 
that development comes from the fertilized egg. All the cells in your body come from the fertilized egg. But I just told you that's not true. That half of the cells in our body are microbes that don't come from the fertilized egg. They start to come from the mother, but not from the fertilized egg. I want to show that organismal development is co-development. We actually use instructions from other species. And I have here this beautiful picture, picture think of Longwood Gardens, of an orchid. An orchid is this gorgeous plant, but an orchid cannot germinate. An orchid cannot produce its shoots or its roots or its flowers unless the seed is invaded by a fungus because the seed is so small that it doesn't have nutrition that's needed to grow. That nutrition is provided by a fungus, which is why the orchids grow in the humid places where the fungi are. So the orchid is really a composite. It's both the orchid flower, but it's also nutrients from fungi. Now, animals also do not exist as independent entities. On the left-hand side is the intestinal vessels of a mouse without bacteria. And what's shown in green are the capillaries. These are the blood vessels that take blood, that take food into the bloodstream and give it to all the cells of your body. And this is a really poor circulatory system around each of these villi of the intestine. However, if you add microbes back, if you add them back, what you get is a very good intestinal vasculature. You get back the blood vessels. You get your normal blood vessels back. How is this happening? Well, the bacteria in your gut, especially a bacteria called Bacteroides theta iota micron, this bacteria is able to induce a gene in the gut cells, a gene in the intestine cells, to produce a protein called angiogenin-4. So most of the time, the gut makes very little angiogenin-4. You add bacteroides, and it makes a 10 times as much as it made originally. Bacteroides bacteria is telling the gut cells, make angiogenin-4. When angiogenin-4 is made, it's secreted from the gut cells, and it tells the cells around the gut, make capillaries, turn into capillaries. So the microbes help the normal gut by inducing genes to become expressed. This is called sympoesis, becoming with the other, that you don't form independently. You actually form, you become with the other organisms. You don't do it on your own. Microbes cause stem cell divisions in the zebrafish gut, in the gut of fish. You have these cells in magenta. Those are dividing stem cells. Without the microbes, hardly any cell in the gut is dividing. There's hardly any stem cells there. And as a result, you have very few cells in the gut compared to what you normally have in the conventionally raised zebrafish or in the zebrafish where you had originally no bacteria, but you added the bacteria back. So the microbes can cause the stem cells in the gut to divide. Not only that in zebrafish, certain microbes are needed to get the pancreas to function. Okay, the pancreas makes insulin. And here we have a conventionally raised zebrafish. And what's shown in green here is the insulin producing cells. The green is staining the protein insulin, the hormone that prevents diabetes, the hormone that allows us to use the sugars in our body. And the, what's blue are just cells. This is the nucleus staining by DNA. So blue is the nucleus and the green is insulin. So this is a zebrafish and it's making a lot of insulin. If you have a zebrafish without the microbes, here is the pancreas, and you have hardly any insulin-producing cells in it. We know the bacterium that's responsible for this. It's Aramonas. It's a very rare type of bacteria. This is not a bacteria that's 
all over the place in the seawater, it's actually quite rare. But the fish need it. And once it's in the gut, it will go and it will make a protein that will cause the pancreas to make insulin secreting cells. Now, this is a paper that came out this week. This is a paper that came out in the current issue of Nature. And what it says here is that in mice, the maternal microbes, the microbes in the gut of the mouse, are needed to promote the axon growth of the neurons in its fetuses. The pregnant mother is making the babies inside it, the fetuses inside it are making their brains. Their brains function because of the microbes that are in the mother's gut. And what we have here, basically the, the neurons can be tested because these are neurons involved in hearing. And so metabolites from the maternal gut microbes enter, they go through the, the placenta, they enter into the brain of the fetus and they cause the neurons to form correctly so that later in life the animal is startled when it hears a loud sound. However, if the mother does not have bacteria in its gut, it does not get these metabolites, it does not get these, these substances made by the microbes, the brain remains immature and when you give the mouse a loud sound, it does not become startled. It is not hearing correctly. These neural behavioral anomalies can actually be corrected by adding clostridium bacteria, not the bad clostridium, but good clostridium bacteria. So the microbes of the mother's gut are helping its fetal nerves to develop. Now germ-free mice, are not normal. Not only do they have anatomical defects, they also have behavioral anomalies. They're not normal behaviorally. Germ-free mice have an autism-like behavioral syndrome. Now, we don't know if mice have autism, but what mice do have, if they don't have bacteria, is they have a syndrome which includes non-sociability, these are asocial mice, they don't like to be with other mice, and they have repetitive grooming behaviors. So here we have a normal mouse in red. It likes to be with other mice. Difference between time spent in chambers. Yeah, this would rather be with other mice than alone. However, the mice that are put in, that have no microbes in their gut, they'd rather be alone. But if you add the microbes back to them, they prefer to be with other mice. Same thing with grooming behavior. There's very little self-grooming behavior in a normal mouse. However, a germ-free mouse has lots of grooming behavior, four times as much as a normal mouse. If you add microbes back to the mouse, you get the normal amount of grooming behavior. There are studies now that indicate that the microbes in humans may be in part responsible for at least the severity of autism syndromes. This is a pilot study. There were only 18 patients. There were no controls. It was, re it was reported last year. But basically, the severity, the severity of autism syndrome went down when these people were given microbes, microbes from healthy, psychologically healthy people. At start, 83% of the people were seen as severe. After two years with different microbes in their gut, only 17% were ranked as severe. And again, there were certain bacteria which were seen as being important. This has to be repeated. This is a fascinating study. Now, so we're not anatomically individuals. We're not physiologically individuals. We're not genetically individuals and we're not developmentally individuals. I want to talk very briefly about the immune system because the immune system is the, sim is the system that's the, supposed to keep out bacteria. But I just told you that bacteria are not kept out. Actually, homes are found for these bacteria in our gut. Germ-free animals have an immune deficiency syndrome. Germ-free animals 
have impaired development of their immune system. They don't have the right amount of T cells. They don't have the right amount and types of B cells. This is the dome and follicle of the gut associated immune system. These are the activated B cells of the immune system and these are the activated T cells of the immune system. Without microbes, you don't have either. Immunology is undergoing a huge change. As Fred Tauber says, from a philosophical perspective, the wavering ontological status of immunology's key concepts, self, individuality, and organism, highlights a science in transition. So the immune system is actually a function of both the microbes and the host. This is a whole new way of looking at the immune system. I want to end by talking about evolution. And here there was a wonderful person, Lynn Margulis, who stressed the fact that we are holobionts, she invented the term, that we live together with other organisms and that we evolve together. She said, in short, I believe that most evolutionary novelty arose and still arises directly from symbiosis. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. Real evolution, she says, is not competition. Real evolution is a mix of competition and a lot of cooperation. And so I just want to end by talking about herbivory, the ability to eat plants. And most people, when they think of herbivores, think of, oh, they're those dull things. They're, you know, yeah, the, the real interesting guys are the carnivores. They hunt and whatnot. Well, the herbivores actually came after the carnivores. The herbivores don't have to hunt. They live in a food court. Thank you. They don't need to do all these energetic things. They're fine. They live in a world full of plants. And of all the herbivores, the ones which come to mind immediately are like the, the great herbivores, which are the ruminants, the cattle, the goats, the sheep, the giraffes, the deers. They have a special stomach. They have a stomach called the rumen, this big thing on the right. This is the rumen. 85% the volume of the stomach is the rumen. Now, the rumen, according to these agricultural researches is essentially a large anaerobic fermentation chamber where plant degrading rumen microbes ferment otherwise non-digestible plant-based foods into volatile fatty acids that can be used for, for eating. So what digests the grass is the bacteria inside the rumen. The rumen is a complex ecosystem. It contains the cellulose degrading bacteria, fungi, and protists that digest the cell walls into the sugars. It contains the fermenting bacteria, which can take those sugars and put them into compounds that'll get into the blood. Also, it has the methane producing archaea, which will reduce the carbon dioxide to CH4, producing methane, not good and also detoxifying bacteria because plants don't like to be eaten and many plants make poisons. And so the rumen also has bacteria which will detoxify the poison. So the rumen is an ecosystem of organisms, of bacteria, which will digest plants and turn them into food for the cow. But it's more than that. The rumen doesn't exist in the newborn cow. The calf, when it is born, has a small flap which will become the rumen. So how does the rumen get made if it's not born, if the calf is not born with the rumen? Well, the microbes go into the gut as the calf is born. And some of those microbes get into the area where this flap exists, which will become the rumen. And they stay dormant there as long as the calf is being fed milk, they don't do a thing. They just stay there. But once the calf is given grain or grass to eat, those microbes are given food. Those microbes can eat this grass, can eat the grain, and they do. And when they eat the grain or grass, they make those short-chain fatty acids. And the short-chain fatty acids enter into that flap, that immature rumen, 
and convert it into the rumen. In other words, the bacteria make their own home. The bacteria make products that induce gene expression in the gut to form the rumen. Here are just some of the genes, it's not important, but they make genes that are involved in cell division so that the gut expands to eventually become 85% the volume of the stomach. And it causes the differentiation of the rumen so that the bacteria have a place to live in. So rumen are present, uh, bac rumen bacteria are present in the rumen since day two. Then they are, uh, they, uh, the but they eventually will be given butyric, they'll be eventually be given grain. The grain is changed into butyric acid. The butyric acid will take that immature rumen, convert it into the mature rumen. The bacteria construct their proliferative niche. The bacteria construct their home. This is developmental symbiosis, like I showed you before. Once the bacteria have a place to live, the bacterial community ferments the grass and grain into simple carbohydrates. This is nutritional symbiosis. So you have both developmental symbiosis, the bacteria makes the rumen, and the nutritive symbiosis, the bacteria in the rumen make the food. So to say, we're not individuals. We become with the other. We're not anatomical individuals. Most of our cells, 50% at least, are microbes. We're not physiological individuals. We have joined our metabolisms to those of the microbes, and the microbes have joined their metabolisms to us. We don't function without the microbes. So we're not physiologically individuals. We're not even developmentally individuals. The gut microbes help build our gut. They help build our immune system they even help the maturation of gut and brain neurons. We're not immune individuals. The microbes help build the immune system and they know what to let in, what not to let in. When I was learning immunology, I learned that the immune system was our passive weaponry. It was our defensive, rather, our defensive army. But now we know they're not an army, it's more like a bouncer or a passport control agent. They know who to let in and who to keep out. Genetic individuality. We share our genomes with that of microbes. We have over a hundred different genomes in our body, many giving phenotypic outcomes. And evolutionary individuality, this is still up in the air, but we know that symbionts can provide selectable variation. And we know that certain organisms like the cow cannot evolve without the symbionts. So we are teams. And that's great. That's a whole new concept. Thinking of ourselves as teams. Like, you know, you might have the best quarterback on the planet, but if that quarterback doesn't have a good receiver, he's useless. It's the team which goes to the playoff, not the individual player. So you complete me. You are a holobiont, a biome and an individual. Animals don't exist as independent entities. We have sympoesis. We literally become with the other. And this is the evolutionary strategy that supports life on Earth. The usable nitrogen in our soil comes from the symbiosis of rhizobacteria and legumes. The ability of plants to grow comes from the interaction of the plant roots with fungus. The coral reefs and tidal seagrass ecosystems, they are involved in the symbiosis of animals and algae. And these big symbioses, within these big symbioses are the symbiotic webs that we call organisms and the products of even more ancient symbioses that we call cells and the products of other ancient symbioses that we call genomes. We are now working on a biology, not of entities, but of relationships. As Richard Powers says, there are no individuals. Competition is not separable from endless flavors of cooperation. In a paper I've written, I said, we're all lichens. And Donna Haraway says, relationships are the smallest possible pattern for analysis 
becoming is always becoming with. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I'm Team Scott Gilbert. I wish I had a rally jacket with all my sponsors. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, and feel free to send more questions in the chat. Looks like we've already gotten a few. Um, and starting from the beginning, I'm talking about um, the mother transferring, um, I guess, some bacteria through the birth process. Um, does this still happen if mom doesn't have a vaginal birth or does not carry the baby to full term, like has the baby early? Yeah, yeah. This is a question where a lot of paper, actually, I'm going to try screen sharing just one more time. And uh, yeah, let's, let's uh, go to the next slides. Do I have them? Yeah, vaginal birth or C-section. Yes, vaginal delivery will give the newborn a more efficient immune system. And this immune system, interestingly, is almost predisposed to stop the opportunistic infections that are usually in the population. C-section children also develop higher risk for type 1 diabetes, food allergies, cow's milk allergies. However, breastfeeding can protect you because breastfeeding also gives you bacteria. Uh, you, in many hospitals, they're now allowing mothers to, uh, you know, basically put vaginal smears on the infant uh, to uh, put in their nose and mouth so that they get exposed to the mother's body. Cuddling of the baby can be very important. But here we have a paper, birth mode is associated with the earliest strain conferred gut microbiome functions and immunostimulatory potential. Those babies who are born vaginally have a better immune system to start off with. And there are certain uh, things which are better in those babies. But as I said, those things can be counteracted by quickly in the environment giving them uh, just by cuddling and breastfeeding them. But yes, this is uh, something which is an ongoing uh, set of research questions. Uh, yeah, vaginal versus C-section. Because it's hard to say because you know whether breastfeeding is here or not. But food allergy uh, is another thing that people are looking at as uh, versus C-section versus uh, uh, vaginal birth. So yes, it could be important. Probably the hospital that you're in makes a difference uh, whether or not you get infections uh, quickly. Uh, those children who were born at, with uh, C-section are prone to get bacteria from the hospital room, which can include some pretty nasty bacteria. But again, breastfeeding can counteract that. So yeah, it's a complex story, yeah, but it's a great question. People are fascinated by it. That's interesting. The next question is, what is your opinion of probiotic food products? Yeah, my, my opinion of probiotic food is that it's a great idea whose time will someday come. I am not a great fan of it now because of, two th of several things. First of all, it's hard for microbes to take over a gut if your gut microbes are already there. It's hard for new bacteria to enter a pre-existing community. So that's one problem. A second thing is each individual's microbiome is different. And so what's good for one person might not be good for another person. The strain of lactobacillus, which works in you, might not even work in another person. Third thing, there's no standardization yet. The probiotic industry is trying to standardize things. They have not got there yet. Uh, lots of disagreements as to how to standardize things. The other big question is, for me, is that there are trade-offs. For instance, lactobacillus ruteri. Everyone says this is going to be phenomenal because lactobacillus seems to help everything. Uh, you know, lactobacillus helps bone growth. It helps uh, uh, establish good rhythms in the gut. Lacto lactobacillus ruteri seems like a definite good guy. Well, a few more experiments were done and lactobacillus ruteri may be associated with depression. Oh, 
You know, so there might be a balance of these bacteria and how much bacteria you have, you may want lactobacillus ruteri, but you might not want it way above other bacteria. So we're just learning that there is not one ecosystem in a gut. There are many gut ecosystems and they may be different for each person. What works for one person might not work for, the, for another person. So I think that uh, when people talk about personalized genomics, I, I, I say, no, without the bacteria, you can't do personalized genomics. And even with bacteria, getting the right bacteria for the right person is going to be really difficult. So I think it's a great idea, but I think it's not there yet. And this isn't part of the written question, but that makes me wonder, does that thinking apply also to kind of more natural probiotic foods, like yeah. fermented I, foods I, that are more traditional? Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of the natural probiotics, a lot of the nutritional supplements actually aid in uh, upregulating the proliferation of bacteria. You know, matter of fact, uh, one of the easiest ways, you change your bacteria every hour. You change your bacteria at the bite of a veggie burger. Uh, and whether you have a veggie burger or a hamburger does make a difference to your bacteria population. And your bacteria population makes a difference in what is going to be put into your blood. If you eat fiber, you allow the bacteria that eat fiber to proliferate because, hey, I'm giving food for that bacteria and not other bacteria. And so that bacteria pro proliferates. And what does it make? It makes short chain fatty acids. And that's good for some things. And then, you know, other bacteria will make other products and so forth. So what you eat actually changes your bacterial population and your bacterial population may change uh, other things in your body that you might not know of. Fortunately for us, uh, the body keeps a good handle on its, you know, on its bacteria. It oscillates, but uh, largely it's kept in at a certain kind of, yeah, you'll always have these, you'll always have those. Uh, but people are now looking at certain diseases, things like colon cancer, things like Crohn's syndrome, things like depression, and they're saying, and autism, and saying, are the bacteria different in these people? And I can tell you the answer. The bacteria are different. Is it causal? We don't know yet. We don't know if it's, you know, one, one thing which has two effects, if one affects the other, but we don't know maybe being depressed gives you this type of bacteria. We don't know. Uh, or they might be just totally coincidental. But right now we do know that there is bacterial differences, for instance, in people who have Crohn's disease, colon cancer, depression, and autism. Whether or not it's causal, we don't know. And sorry, going through the list, oh, we have a lot of good questions. Um, in the mice studies where bacteria were added, is it something that needs to um, be dosed more than once or once the microbe is added, the body can sustain it? And I guess yeah. it's what you were just talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends how the microbe is gotten into the body. If you actually do it by lavage or through the rectum, you have to do it more often. However, there's something, as you probably have heard of it, called called fecal transplant therapy. And fecal transplant therapy is where they wipe out your bacteria. They basically like give you a colonoscopy prep and then they'll give you another colonoscopy prep so that you don't have bacteria in your gut anymore. And then they will add into your gut someone else's fecal bacteria. Then that fecal bacteria kind of takes over and, uh, and takes over the gut. And that has been very important in getting rid of a horrible disease called Clostridium uh, diarrhea. And Clostridium difficile diarrhea is a life-threatening diarrhea where you could die of uh, dehydration. And th so this is incredibly severe and important and it can be stopped in a large percentage of patients by taking a friend's feces getting the bacteria from that person's poop and putting it inside you. 
Uh, it's called fecal transplant therapy. And it's being now licensed more and more. Uh, again, has to be standardized. And you know, this is something that you could do at home with a turkey baster, but uh, they say don't do it because uh, you don't know if your friend has some bad bacteria uh, in his or her gut. And so it would be very nice to do this at a hospital and just take the good guys. But it's something which, uh, it's one of the nice things, it's a very cheap technology. It is not a very expensive thing to do and it works. So do you know, is that what they tend to do for mice or are mice a little bit simpler? No, this is actually done in humans. Oh, no, I know it's done in humans, oh. but I guess for the oh. mouse experiments when they're- Oh yeah. Oh, for the mice, yeah. I think only one lavage is, is sufficient uh, mm -hmm. to add things to germ-free mice, yeah. Um, does the use of antibiotics in raising cattle affect their digestion? Yes, it does. It does indeed. And uh, this is one of those trade-off things is uh, because people, you know, antibiotics are added for two reasons. One is to protect against bacterial disease and the other is because the cattle gain weight faster if they don't have the microbes. And so you want the cattle to gain weight, fine, they do this. But in so doing, you actually make the cattle less efficient at making milk, for instance. And so there's, again, trade-offs. You know, how much antibiotics are you gonna use? Now, there's a whole uh, group now who's saying, you don't use any. And if you don't use any, you get happier cattle that are able to make more milk you know, per, you know, per gra you know, gram of grass. So, yeah, these are, these are things that people are just dealing with now. People are looking at the cow microbiome in great detail because, first of all, the cow microbiome plays a major role in determining the quality and quantity of the milk produced. Okay, that's interesting for the breeders of the cows. The other thing that makes it interesting is that the cow microbiome is responsible for producing methane, which is a greenhouse gas. And it's a major contaminant of the atmosphere. I mean, the amount of cattle that's being raised on this planet is enormous. And they are belching greenhouse gas methane. And there are people now who are trying to modify the microbiome of the rumen such that methane is not produced. So yeah, people are really looking at the rumen microbiome in a lot of detail. It's a, you know, it, there was a New York Times article on it in the business section. That's where, that's why you know, people are looking at the rumen of the cow. Yeah, I, a while ago I worked at a place that sold raw milk and there was a lot of talk of like what the cows ate and then what was in the milk in terms of bacteria. Yeah, yeah. This is a, we kind of forget that cow's milk actually is for calves. That you know, this is this is for calves. It's to feed the young calf, not not the human. But the calf is weaned very early, and some people say far too early, uh, so that it can start making milk itself uh, by you know eating the grains and eating the grasses. So and you want then the mother to have the milk, so it can feed humans. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, uh, the whole cattle breeding industry is, is, is absolutely fascinating and is undergoing a lot of changes as we learn more about what is going on with the microbes. Because usually when you talk about cattle breeding, you're talking about bull sperm. You're talking about how to breed the genome of the cow and how to get great milk producers. But now it's been found that the bacteria also play a major role. And so this is, again, causing a lot of change in you know, milk producing, you know, its stakeholders. Finding a lot more layers. A lot of layers, yep. Um, how can, and I guess can, um, obese people change their gut microbes to become lean? Um, diet, <laughs> cleansing, probiotics? I really wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't know the answer to that. And again, uh, there's some really good stuff in mice about, uh, you know, certain bacteria, which seems to uh, 
uh, make mice uh, less obese and other bacteria that tend to make mice more obese. But they haven't, the, the same studies haven't worked in humans, that the same bacteria don't seem to be uh, those in humans, although uh, Christianella seemed to be something which may have some effect. But uh, no, it seems like we're dealing with whole ecosystems, uh, not individual bacteria. And that's problematic. It's, it means there won't be the magic probiotic pill that will all of a sudden mean I can eat my hot fudge sundae and not worry about it. Uh, but, you know, basically as, you know, uh, Pollen says, you know, what your grandmother said is probably right. You know, eat, eat food, eat, you know, little, little amounts and try to get a lot of fiber. Yeah, that's fi fiber really. I mean, I've been impressed the material that says fiber is really good for you. I mean, yeah, I should have done that years ago. Um, this is kind of on the same vein. Um, do you think that the increase in pesticides and herbicides and antibiotics might be deleting some important microbes in our environment that we need to function well? Yes, I do. Uh, this is, there's a person, Martin Blazer, who would be a wonderful speaker. Uh, He's at, uh, he's in New York City, and he has a book out uh, where he proclaims that, you know, he, and he, he's, he has evidence. And he was one of the people who first said, you know, asthma might be due to not having the normal bacteria. And that we expect to have certain bacteria. And our, our fetishism with cleanliness, our you know, wiping our hands every moment may really have bad effects because we, our bodies have evolutionary expected certain bacteria at a certain rate to come into the body. And just as there are trace nutrients that are not needed in great amounts, but they are needed, there might be trace bacteria that are needed in small amounts, but they're needed and we might be killing these bacteria off with all of our, you know, uh, our, our, you know, cleanliness regimens, all of our microbiocides and stuff, and that we may need this bacteria. And, you know, you have to remember that until World War I, humans were intimately connected to horses. That one of the biggest changes in society ever came during World War I, where we humans divorced the horse. Philadelphia had over a hundred stables because anyone who was anyone had a horse. And if you weren't anyone who was anyone, you took care of their horses. I mean, horses were part and parcel of your being a person living in a town or living in the country. And, you know, horse gave you status and whatnot. And the big problem of cities in 1912 was getting rid of horse droppings from the street. The streets of cities were becoming infested with flies and all sorts of vermin because people were not picking up their horse droppings. Okay. So all of a sudden, after World War I and the car, we got rid of the horse. And... <laughs> The original thing was, hey, we're going to get rid of all this poop and get rid of all of our pollution, aren't we? Uh, but we got other pollutions. Uh, and not, and th that might have been a huge thing biologically because now we didn't have farmyards near us. We didn't have the horse near us. And, you know, you get licked by a horse, you get all their bacteria. I mean, uh, a tr dogs transfer about 8 million bacteria when they lick you. That's a good size, yeah, yeah. And they find, by the way, that horses share the back, uh, dogs and humans share the bacteria where they live in the same house. Yeah. They, they get used to each other, their bacteria flows. So if dogs transfer about 8 million bacteria when they lick you, does, how many does a horse transfer? That I don't know, but apparently a good kiss is also about 8 million. Interesting thing to count that. <laughs> um, actually, this is the next question is um, 
right on topic and that's my dog has horrible allergies and he also tries to eat dog poop goose poop deer poop which i prevent him from doing mm. do you think if he ate the poop he might benefit from the bacteria to decrease his allergic reactions wow i have no idea but it if you're willing to do the experiment, you know, uh, <laughs> talk to the you Don't let the dog lick you after that. Yeah, I don't think you want to let the dog lick you, but, you know, let it pass through the dog, you know. Uh, yeah, I, th I think dog slobber is, uh, you know, one of the, could be a very good protective thing for many things, including uh, depression. But, uh. And um, why did you choose the image on your first slide? Of, uh, of, we, of of the, the woman wearing a, a thing that says, I love bacteria, and then the gut bacteria. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to uh, just go with the, uh, 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 the, the movie thing, the movie slogan, uh, you know, you completely, you know, the uh, uh, sports movie. Uh, and just have, yes, we are completed by bacteria. And so I thought that having a woman wearing uh, a I love bacteria shirt would be uh, appropriate and to have her gut bacteria over her midsection. Uh, usually when I show that slide, I have another slide of a male model uh, as, as well. Uh, and I talk about, you know, different models in uh, uh, looking at uh, bacterial interaction and I show him as a model, but didn't get to it this slide. Uh, actually, they were referring to the um, the tree one, which I guess. Oh, the tree! Oh, yeah, the tree. Uh, I like the notion in that tree, that tree that looks like it's a human, uh, of the non-separation of humans from the environment. I think that that's one of the things that symbiosis shows us is that what we've been calling environment is part of us that it's an integral part of us. It's a working part of us. And I think that uh, uh, when you look at the animal kingdom, you find that so much of the animal kingdom integrates environmental cues into its normal working. Uh, I work on turtles uh, and uh, turtle sex determination, whether a turtle is male or female, depends on the temperature that the egg is laid at. During the first weeks of turtle development, whether it's going to be male or female, depends on the temperature that the egg is at. So here, the egg is taking something from the environment and using it. Our immune system, the immune system of the human being, changes daily depending on what's breathed in and what's eaten. It changes what it's responding to. Uh, and it develops differently. We have a different set of immune cells depending on who we sat next to and who sneezed. Uh, I think that uh, we are part of the environment. And that's what that human looking tree shows so beautifully. Also, uh, you know, it goes back to, uh, you know, the, the myth of uh, Daphne, you know, who uh, turned herself into the laurel tree and stuff. Uh, and this notion that we are constantly becoming, that we are becoming with the environment. So I just like to have that as an opening slide to uh, introduce this notion that the, uh, we are not really separated from the environment anymore. Uh, we can't think of ourselves that way. And I think, again, those of you who are playing with this notion of the Anthropocene, uh, what uh, uh, Chakraborty said, uh, a few years ago, that the whole notion of the Anthropocene means that there's no difference between natural history and human history, that those have come together. And I just think that is an absolutely fascinating idea. Mm -hmm. It's very poetic. <laughs> uh, do you see any relationship between your thesis and arguments that anti-vaccine advocates make that vaccines lead to autism? If so, if not, why? Um, and the person notes I don't hold anti-vaccine beliefs personally. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is, there's no science behind the anti-vaccine beliefs. That was made up data. And the person who, the doctor who formulated those data and put it out has been, you know, debarred or whatever the medical establishment does. I mean, there's no data for vaccines causing autism. And they've done studies looking at this 
and it doesn't. The type of mercury that was used in the vaccines is not, doesn't even have the effects that uh, other mercury does. It's, uh, uh, I've worked only once when I was about 50, 40 years ago on vaccines and vaccines actually can be looked at, I think, as holistic medicine actually naturopathic medicine, because vaccine is using a small dose of what's bad to tell the body how to react against it. I mean, I think that, that uh, vaccination is actually a, a very naturopathic type of medicine. It's not you know, having a drug against the bacteria, it's making the body's defense against the small part become active. Uh, so, I don't think there's any evidence for uh, vaccines causing autism or for that matter, any other disease except uh, uh, some pain where you get on the site where you're vaccinated. But uh, no, I am actually, uh, uh, I've been incredibly impressed actually by the importance of vaccination. I think the 20th century will be known as the century of vaccination that, uh, you know, Pasteur, started vaccinations in the uh, 1870s or so. And uh, a Frenchman living now lives twice as long as a Frenchman who was living in Pasteur's time. Twice as long. The average Frenchman in Pasteur's time died at the age of 41. Imagine that. When you live in a city, you died in, the, in your 40s. And now people are routinely dying like around 80. That's, that's just amazing. And I think vaccines and public health, I, I put a huge amount of faith in good public health systems, much more than in medicine itself. Medicine deals with the individual, public health deal with population, and vaccines are part of public health. I think, it's in, I think that they have changed the way we function in a society. I was talking to somebody yesterday, people were worrying about, you know, here we have Supreme Court justices chosen for life, you know, and, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg lived till into her 80s. Uh, you know, the person who Trump is important might, you know, live 60 years or, you know, might live 50 or so years and still be a Supreme Court justice. That's right, because originally Supreme Court justices were supposed to die in their 50s. You know, when people say you are married until death do you part, that wasn't hard. Death parted people pretty quickly, you know. So uh, the biology has changed with people living so long, and I think that's largely due to public health and vaccination. Hopefully, the twenty first century will also become the I century hope. of public health. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I think that's the greatest advance in the twenty first century. Twenty. We we're coming up on close to time, and we have a bunch of. Yeah. Very good questions left. Um, choose one that I think is a little bit more divergent from what we've covered, and that's: um, Can you describe the clinical response to certain drugs um, in immunotherapy due to differences in the enterobiome? Uh, yeah, this is an amazing situation. Thank you for whoever asked that question. Uh, there are certain cancer drugs. There are certain drugs that are used uh, to prevent heart attacks. There are certain drugs which uh, are anti-epileptics and they get digested by certain bacteria. Different sets of bacteria will act on different cancer drugs. Some bacteria will activate them into even more potent forms. Some bacteria will digest them into inert forms. And so when a person is being tested, you know, people are saying, oh, when we know your genome, we'll know what drug to use. Well, you also have to know their bacterium. You have to know what bacteria are in their body because the bacteria can actually change the results of whether a drug is effective or not. That is kind of amazing. Also, there are certain diseases that were thought of as being like protein deficiency diseases. Quasiocor was your classic protein deficiency disease, but it's only a protein deficiency disease if you have certain bacteria, not if you have other bacteria. So the bacteria can be very important in modulating your response to certain drugs. Yeah. 
Interesting. And I guess if you have time for a very brief kind of okay. wrapping it up question okay. is, um, sure. what do we do with this knowledge? And I assume kind of for people listening versus science in general, um, what is its application beyond understanding? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think several things. One is it gives us a lot of humility. Uh, I, you know, I jokingly say, you know, Freud said that uh, humanity underwent three assaults. One was the assault that we're not in the center of the universe by Copernicus. The second one was that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, what was it? Uh, uh, I can't remember the second. The third one was psychoanalysis, that the brain wasn't uh, the center. Oh yeah, the Darwinian was the second one, that humans are just a sweaty ape. Uh, the third one that uh, we're, you know, consciousness isn't as vaulted a thing as it should be psychoanalysis. And I think this is the fourth one that says, hey, you know, we're part of the world. We're not separate from the world. Each of us has the world flowing through us. And I think that this notion of us changing our parts, not only metabolically, but cellularly, and that we need the outside to function properly. I think that this will actually be important in our paying more attention to our diet because now we actually have some of the missing links. When you say, oh, fiber is good for you, why? Oh, I don't know, it just seems some people are healthier when they have fiber. No, now we know that the microbes are acting on the fiber. I mean, I think that the, miss the microbes are providing the missing link between the environment and physiology. And I think that that will make a difference in how we think of ourselves. I also think of the notion of thinking ourselves as a community, as a team, and that the members of the team are changing and that we are in symbiotic relationship with the planet. I mean, that's, we're not, you know, most of biology has talked about competition, that we are, you know, it's the battle of each against all. And now it says, actually, no, it isn't. Yeah, of course, there is some competition, but a lot of the big picture involves this cooperation. And cooperation is not fuzzy. Cooperation is not necessarily warm, fuzzy. You have to make the team. And anyone who's gone out for an athletic team knows that there's competition to be on the team. But once you make the team, it's a cooperative effort. And then you're playing against other cooperative teams. So I think that there's this interplay between cooperation and competition that hasn't been seen before. It hasn't been naturalized. And now I think it's the natural thing. So look at evolution and physiology, not merely as competition, but as a mixture of competition and cooperation in modes that we really haven't even the vocabulary yet to discuss. I feel like it's the appropriate amount of complexity for uh, where we are right now in society. <laughs> Scott, I just want to thank you, and I know you have something to go off to, but... We have a birthday party. Yes, which is great, and um, you always change completely the way I understand and look at the world. And um, thank you so much. We'll have you back anytime you can thank spare. You. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And I'm just going to quote one thing in the chat. Um, somebody who said that their mind was blown and expanded, which seems like the perfect Thank ending. So much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Join us for the next talk. Bye-bye. <laughs>